Mass. Uh, ca right calling to place. order the um, meeting of the Amherst Regional School Committee, Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee of August 30th, 2011. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and thank you ACTV for bringing this to people at home. Um, first order of business, oh, Irv, could you call to order the Amherst Committee, please? We call to order the Amherst uh, School Committee. We do have a quorum. And Kathy? I'll call to order the Pelham School Committee meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, first order of business is reorganization for the regional committee, which means picking a chair and a vice chair. So for this part of the meeting, I turn it over to Maria until the chair is voted on. Thank you. So um, only the regional members will um, be in this discussion. So Annie, you won't be in this discussion for region. So I think what I'd like to do is to ask for um, a, a, a nomination for a chair. Is there anyone who'd like to make one? Irv? Yeah, um, Rick Hood for chair. Do we have a second? Debbie seconded. Um, so at this point, I'd like to just go through a roll call and have each person down the line say, state the person who they would like to, um, we have a, a person nominated, but to go through that, okay? So Debbie, um, would you start for us and say who for chair? Rick Hood. Uh, Rick Hood. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I pass this over to you again. All right, thank you. Are there nominations for vice chair? You can nominate yourself, by the way. Uh, Debbie. Well, I don't know if she'll accept it, but I would nominate Catherine Oppie. Thank you. Second, Will. Okay, there's a second. Any other nominations? Okay, why don't we start with you again, Debbie? Catherine Oppie. Uh, Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppie. Catherine Oppi, okay, we're done. Thank you. Um, next thing is um, agenda review. Uh, are there any additions or questions about the agenda? Oh. Kathy? Can you look at yours for a second? So, in new and continuing business, I'm wondering if we can start with the district improvement plan for this current year and embed number A, the progress, while we're talking about the current plan. I'm just concerned that we're not gonna have enough time to talk about the current plan, so I wanna make sure it's. I think that's a great idea. I was actually going to, I, I spoke with Rick on the phone, I'd like to make a brief presentation to kind of connect the dots with um, the district improvement plan, where we've been and where we're going. Um, and then ask for questions and feedback on the progress and the district improvement plan. So we're kind of having that conversation as a whole. So I was hoping that worked for people. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> next on the agenda is approved minutes of June 14th. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Is it seconded? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved for June 14th. Um, are there any announcements or public comments? I see one. Okay, um, when you come forward, please state your name and try to keep it to two or three minutes. I'll let you know at two minutes. And um, Good evening. Um, my name is Michael Aronson. I'm an Amherst taxpayer. I was forwarded in an email Mr. Hood wrote on Monday, August 8th, expressing his opinion that it was, quote unquote, less expensive to hire an outside attorney to litigate a special education matter, even though the school district had a prepaid contract with an in-house attorney. I don't know where you learned math, Mr. Hood. But I can assure you that the $3,000 you pay your in-house attorney per month, regardless of what he has to do, is not less, I mean, is less than the $3,000 plus the fees you pay for an outside attorney hired to do the very same thing. Every member of this committee should be up in arms about an administrative decision 
to waste precious education dollars in this way. Mr. Hood, as chairman of this committee, you should be making very public inquiries into why the decision to hire duplicative legal services was made. Tell us who is responsible for this violation of the public trust and why you consider it acceptable. You should be asking what other decisions your administrators are making that are equally improper. Your negligence and that of the administrator who made this decision is hurting our children and our community. This is shameful, it is malfeasant, and it's terrible policy. Parents who come to Amherst for their children's education and pay handsomely in taxes for the privilege are appalled by the tremendous waste this kind of decision represents. Let us be clear, you have failed them. Thank you for your time. Okay, moving on to superintendent's update. Can I? Uh, yes, I, I guess I, I too am concerned about this. We have a retainer agreement with an attorney and it appears that there is um, at least some of the special education uh, cases that involve another attorney and I'd like to hear an explanation. You have to deal with their Rick. Not tonight. Uh, if, if Mr. Riffin has a question, Steve has a question about the specific circumstance. Um, Rick has been made aware of the circumstance and has been involved in the conversation and I would suggest that we not do it in public session because it has to do with specific uh, children and situations. So I don't see that it's something we can get into right now. Well, I, I, I mean, I think it's a real problem. We have a retainer agreement with someone to, to handle all special education <coughs> cases. Those that were uh, going before the person took over and any cases that start now, and it's $36,000 a year, I believe. And, and I don't understand how we can have a retainer agreement and, um, you know, and then hire someone else to do some cases. And I think if, if our current attorneys are not capable of handling some cases, then they need to return, so he needs to, he, his firm needs to return us some of the money because we hired that firm to do all the special ed cases. And if that person has not turned us down, but rather is just not being used, then that's a real problem for us because we talk all the time about lack of funds. If we have a retainer agreement, it's my view that only that firm of Dupere and Dupere should be doing special education cases. And it's not meddling or micromanaging because it's our responsibility to select the attorney. And so, um, I mean, I think it's appropriate for this school committee, you know, to make a motion to instruct the administration that we will no longer pay for the special education services of another attorney. And I think that going forward, it's already been six or seven months since we've had that attorney, that um, we need an explanation. And if you don't want to do it in public, then, then, and I think it needs to be in public because, and it doesn't have to involve the names of the children. But I think the public and the school committee deserve an explanation as to why we're double paying for special education services. And if, and if it is our lawyer who says this, then that lawyer should be paying for the special education services. Is he contracted to do all the special education cases? There, um, Kristen, why don't you go in and I'll yeah, go. I just, I wanna, I, I think if you, we end up making a motion at some point, that's a, a fair discussion. Um, but I will say my memory of the hiring of the legal firm was that um, in our discussions in the, in the committee, the policy committee that was discussing this, um, we assured uh, the special education director at that time that uh, cases that had begun prior to the hiring of the new lawyer would be continued by the same lawyer. Until those cases are closed, all new cases would be taken on by the new attorney. So there seems to be uh, disagreement here or um, so that should be figured out um, and if it ends up with the motion that we take on a different tack than my memory fine but I do remember that differently you know, a, a, a new case cannot be defined as an old case coming back I mean if, if it was an old case uh, that was uh, subject to litigation or going on to a hearing um, but it was uh, dropped or somehow um, 
suspended, but then comes back, uh, it would fall under the policies un under which you just spoke about, uh, Christian. I know we have a lot to do, but I, I want to clarify. Is our contract with Dupere and Dupere state explicitly that we are only paying for special education services for new cases that have never been filed, let alone anything else? Or does our contract with Dupere say that they are, we are paying a retainer to handle all special education cases? Um, you, know, I, you know, both Kristen and I were on that committee, and, um, and it, it really should be uh, borne in mind that um, when we hired Dupere and Dupere to do special education, we realized that there were some cases that were ongoing, especially those that were in hearings, that it would not be um, good for Dupere to take those cases on and be brand new. He, in effect, uh, agreed with that. We thought that was a wise policy. I believe that, that it is a wise policy. And again, if, that, if the case was old at some point and was being handled by the former attorney and then somehow was dropped or came back, it would fall under that policy because it had been and handled by that, uh, the former attorney and that attorney would be more familiar with it um, than um, the uh, Dupere and Dupere, even though it would seem that, hey, this is a new case. In reality, um, as far as I'm concerned, it is not a new, a new case. Catherine. Yeah, I, I think this sounds like it's an it's a extended conversation. And um, I'm just aware that we have a very full agenda. So I wonder if it doesn't make sense to uh, talk at another time about putting this on a future agenda, perhaps. All right. It's uh, superintendent's update. Thank you. So I'm going to be very brief because I gave um, um, an extended update in Amherst and I'm going to be doing a fair amount of, of discussion around our progress tonight. But I did want to mention just a, a couple of dates that are coming out very soon. So the first day of the common, I'm hoping that everyone will come and join us to celebrate the start of this new school year with our students. And that will be Thursday, September 1st from 5.30 to 7.00. Um, again, I'd like to mention that we're really partnering uh, widely around this, um, this celebration and we're having um, vision and, and screenings for adults and children. We're having human service networks there to provide literature and educational information for families. Um, we're having a number of um, performers and arts and crafts for children. Um, and we will be partnering with um, um, the, the drive for the Amber Survival Center around um, dignity for all, and we're asking people to bring um, purchased underwear, and they will be um, have a collection center there. So we will be partnering around um, gathering some supplies for our uh, community partners. So again, this is a wonderful event. We hope everyone will come, and we'll be sharing this information um, widely with our families. Also, um, the Backpack Project is well underway, and we're partnering with the Safe Seats for, for Kids program, which is a grant-funded um, initiative through the Amherst um, Police Department. So we will be providing for families backpacks this week, um, which is Wednesday from 11 to 3, and Thursday and Friday, um, oh, I'm sorry, Wednesday 1 through 4, and um, Thursday and Friday 11 to 3, families can come, and we've had many, many families call in to be coming to pick up backpacks. Mm -hmm. Also, um, at that same time, we will have the police department there, and they will be providing um, booster seats and car seats for families. So again, just important information for our community. And then also, I just wanted to extend again formally to the school committee members to join us on Friday, which is our convocation for mm -hmm. our staff. It's our first, our first day with staff. Um, at 8 o'clock in the morning, we'll be um, having coffee and greeting. And then at 8.30, we start promptly. And I'm hoping that the three chairs will consider saying a few words as well to um, our staff. So but I would love you all to be there so I could acknowledge you um, and stand and um, applaud our staff and their work that they do for our children. Um, one last bit of information that I want to show our sample that I mentioned in Amherst and I think I've mentioned it in a few other school committees now. One of our safety initiatives is to develop 
a crisis response procedure flip chart for each classroom in our schools. And this is actually completed, and David Sloven was driving around to schools to deliver this <coughs> today. And it's really exceptional in every classroom. Teachers will have, what do you do when? So this has been a long time coming, um, and these are in classrooms now. So if people want to take a look at these later, I welcome that. So that's, that's it for the updates for tonight. Any questions, follow-up? All right, moving on to, uh, I guess, a review of the district improvement plan for this year that just ended. We'll start with that. Um, I first want to say that I'm really glad that we're finally getting to these things. I don't think we got to them last year at all. And um, I know it's my vision that I hope that we treat these district improvement plans as kind of our Bible and that we spend a lot of time um, reviewing them. Um, if it were up to me, I'd do it every meeting and pull out the plan and see how we're doing on it. But at least, you know, four meetings a year or so, we could perhaps devote a whole meeting to doing nothing but reviewing the plan and how we're doing against the plan. So. Thank you. Um, actually, I'd like to ask one quick question of the committee first. Um, I neglected to say we do have updated enrollments. Is it okay to the committee that we do this under a new and continuing business, or should we do it now during updates? I apologize. I just glanced over and I forgot that we have this. I told the committee I would have that for the Amherst um, elementary schools. Would people like to do that right now, or would they like to do that under continuing business? Sure, I just wanted to make sure I gave you the updated information. Uh, so just briefly, we were looking closely at um, kindergarten at Crocker Farm in Wildwood the last time we spoke, um, and second grade for Crocker Farm and um, Wildwood. So now you have a bit of an updated enrollment as of um, today. So um, Kathy is here if there are additional questions related to this, but at this moment we're feeling um, fairly comfortable with the class sizes. We've, we have moved five kindergarten students from Crocker Farm to Fort River at this time, as I mentioned to the Amherst Committee the other day. So are there specific questions? I guess the question is the same. It's the Wildwood second versus fifth grade. So I guess we're down from 24 to 23. Yes. But 23 is a lot less desirable. Um, and we still have, we sort of have the bigger classroom in second grade as opposed to fifth grade. And it mm -hmm. seems backwards. And I wonder if there's, um, and I know that there was one of the people pulled out to be a coach was a second grade teacher at Fort River. So I just wonder if, you know, if there's any way to do anything about this because you know, all of the evidence says this, that class size is much more important in second grade than in fifth grade. So I will be, um, at this point, it is extremely difficult, as we talked about last time, to move a teacher from one um, assignment to another. Um, I have been in contact with the principals around these class sizes, and at this moment, they are comfortable given their resources to meet the needs of the children and given the composition of the groups. Again, I will be meeting with principals further this week, so I would be happy to raise that question again just to ensure that they're comfortable with class size. You're welcome. Okay. Oops, not a little in your copy. Okay, so I'm going to shift into a brief presentation. I'm sorry, we have a PowerPoint, but of course, the screens aren't working. So very quickly, when I was walking out of the office, Jerry said to me, that wasn't working last week. You might want to make quick copies of the PowerPoint. Um, so it's not the best copy. I wish it were in color and, and um, nice for all of you. But I think I have enough copies for the committee. So I'll wait till that comes around so that we can um, speak about it a little bit. Maria, is, it, is this what's in our packet in the back of the, no, okay. So what I thought I would do is, and I'll, I'll just start, and, and you won't need to follow along here just for a few minutes. I'm just gonna take a few minutes to talk about um, and provide some general information um, regarding the district improvement plan before we discuss goals for the school year so that you can see where the school committee goals are embedded as well as before we talk about the superintendent evaluation. As we have expressed um, 
in conversations numerous times. We all, I feel we have a very strong school system that does meet the educational needs of many, many children, many, many. Um, however, um, at this point, we do not meet the needs of all of our students. And therefore, um, we have to adjust our practice in our approach to our work. And these are substantial changes. Our district improvement plan provides a roadmap for us to move forward, and it does create the structures for continuous improvement. We, you'll see this year that there's a strong connection between the district improvement plan and the school improvement plans. The committee in Amherst has seen, they saw um, Crocker Farm school improvement plan and there were very strong connections made. And you'll see that throughout your presentations this fall. In order to move a system of 600 to 800 human beings, um, a transformation of the culture has to occur. And to do, to really to do our work differently, um, we have to do our work differently to really shift, uh, for the shift to occur. It's not that we can just say, here's what we're going to do, and then it magically happens. We really need to support a shift by creating a structure that people work within and to learn and develop. So we have created a structure and a vehicle. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, again, we have to hold a clear vision of where we want to go as a school district. We need to support our staff with the tools so that they can improve their practice. We need to monitor their implementation. And then we need to assess how effectively we as a system have reached that vision. Um, we've spent this past year creating the vehicle to move forward using research and best practice. And we are up and running and there's much work to do. Uh, so I wanted to provide a little context and I want to draw your attention to now in your packet um, a, a document called the Conditions for School Effectiveness Self-Assessment. And this was published by and voted on by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in spring of 2010. So if you'll turn just to the first page. These conditions articulate what schools need to have in place to educate their students well. And this provides a benchmark by which our schools and all schools can gauge their practice in these key areas. What I intended to do on PowerPoint, which I will now walk you through here, is to really show you these nine conditions. I'm, I apologize to the audience that you won't have this in front of you. It makes it more difficult to follow. So there are nine general conditions that the DESC has identified for school districts to have in place so that we, they educate their students well. You see effective school leadership, aligned curriculum, effective instruction, professional development, and structures for collaboration tiered instruction and adequate learning time, student assessment, student social, emotional, and health needs, family school engagement, and strategic use of resources and adequate budget authority. I'd like to talk about the first five top, uh, conditions briefly as setting the stage for the district improvement plan. Again, I've provided you the source, the, the link, so that you can look at this whole document that we will be using as a way to assess our schools. So, um, and I've also included in the slides a few samples of what would our schools look like if we implemented these, con these conditions consistently. For example, if you look at the first page where it's effective school leadership, what would it look like um, in our schools if we met the effective school leadership condition? We would see instructional leadership teams representing the school's grades and content areas, meeting regularly to address topics of instruction and learning. We would see that the schools have an improvement plan focused explicitly on instructional improvement and student learning. We would see inquiry, reflection, and feedback being encouraged as part of our developing and monitoring of these plans. And we would see school leadership models that support lifelong learning of the adults. Next page, we would also see aligned curriculum where staff can describe how the content they teach builds on and relates to content in other subjects or grades. We would see instructional staff engaging in regular discussions of student learning expectations, both horizontally and vertically. We would see periodic reviews of student learning, inform revisions to curriculum maps, lesson planning, and related resources. We would see in terms of effect, effective instruction, we would see student assignments that contain rigorous embedded learning objectives that reflect high expectations. Our instruction would align with student learning needs that have been identified through universal screenings and formative assessment. We would see teachers engaging in ongoing focused discussion and collaboration 
They'd reflect on instructional practices. And effective instruction is modeled for the teachers by leaders, coaches, and colleagues. And we'd have instructional staff have the opportunity to observe and provide feedback on their colleagues' practice. In terms of professional development and structures for collaboration, we would see professional development that's embedded as an integral part of our daily routines. We would see that time is built into our school schedule for staff collaboration, with collaboration serving as professional development. Systems and protocols would be in place to guide our collaborative discussions. We would see promising practices for teaching and collaboration identified and shared. We would have a tiered instruction, instructional model, and adequate learning time. All lessons would be integrated and differentiated so that 80 to 90% of our students learn their key concepts within classrooms without the need of intervention. We would see a universal screening system that's used to assess the academic and the behavioral strengths and challenges of students. We would see flexible tiers of research-based interventions that supplement and enhance and provide access to core curriculum for students who need additional support. The school schedule would be flexible and provide adequate time for both core instruction and additional academic and or behavioral supports. I think it's very important for you to see these because these are the standards and considered best practice by the state. And this is a foundation for the work that we in our district are doing. I also um, think it's important to note that when you look at the evaluations for um, administrative leadership practice, which is what a superintendent's evaluation is based on, these, these conditions are infused into that evaluation process as well. So all the dots are connected. So the district improvement plan takes these conditions that we've identified a few of, and it provides a roadmap to move us to making these conditions a reality in our schools. So we have spent a lot of time creating a vehicle and a structure to implement a continuous cycle of improvement. Again, it's not a linear um, action plan that you can say to staff, here's what you do, and then it magically happens. You need to, you need to create the structure so people have the opportunity to learn and grow in their work. So if you'll turn to the next page, what we have done at this point, we've created a district instructional leadership team that meets two times per month. It has the principals, assistant principals, district directors, and administrators, educational administrators. And we engage in an ongoing cycle of adult learning. We're focused on improving instruction and student learning. That's our sole focus of that four-hour block of time. We develop collective commitments we norm our practice to ensure alignment of our work. We've developed mechanisms for gathering data from classrooms to inform our practice and our goals. The next, which it would look much prettier on a um, PowerPoint, the next is you can also see we've create, um, created school instructional leadership teams. So now our work is being infused at the school level so that we're bringing this unwavering focus on teaching and learning to the building level, so the principals have a core leadership team to help them bring this to scale. The next page you can see, we now have teacher teams. So these teacher teams now engage in adult learning, focusing again on instruction and student learning. They implement a cycle of inquiry where instruction and student learning is the core. They look at strategies, they make adjustments based on the evidence. So basically they develop plans together they try things out in the classroom, they bring the evidence back of student work, and then they adjust their practice. And they develop plans for intervention and for challenge for students. That engine is in place. Excuse me. We're also strengthening a tiered instructional model. So if you turn to the next page, Kathy. Can I just ask you a question of about course. the teacher team? Please. So it shows the teams coming out from each school. And yes. so, so I'm wondering, in this structure, you had talked previously about teams of teachers in similar grades across the schools. Yes. So does that not, is that not part of this? That's a different? No, but what I would say to you is once you have the teacher teams in place and you have grade level teams, for instance, working together to plan, to implement, to gather student work and to evaluate that work, 
then you have the opportunity to look across schools and across levels and slice, say all of the grade K through two teacher teams are going to meet on a regular basis to look at content related to mathematics within a cycle of inquiry. So we have the opportunity to share and to norm our practice, its alignment within a school and then across schools and then also to have some of the um, vertical conversations as well. So is it reflected in that model? No, but it is absolutely um, in, in a plan and it will be reflected in the district improvement plan. So the next page is you'll see an, um, a tiered instructional model. Um, thank Crocker Farm for starting um, creating this model and this is just our first prototype. And what I really want to call your attention to is in these conditions that you just we just heard a little bit about, the conversation is that 80 to 90 percent of students should be in, cl in classrooms um, benefiting from um, a consistently aligned guaranteed curriculum where teachers understand where, what they're supposed to be teaching, what resources they're supposed to be using, that we have universal screening data that informs their instruction, where they have coaches to help them to improve, and that they rely on their colleagues to share best practice on the academic side. And again, on the behavioral, social, emotional, mental health needs in our schools, you'll see the same on the other side of, of the triangle. We have opportunities for students to learn about the core values. What does it mean to be um, respectful within the cafeteria? What does it mean to be on the bus? So that we're not leaving it to chance that children just naturally um, understand what our adult expectations are. So we have the opportunity, again, for explicit direct instruction in the classroom, as well as um, support from guidance staff and other mental health professionals to support teachers. We also have, um, or will be using the educator's handbook, which you'll, which you'll see um, in the district improvement plan, where we're able to use discipline data to adjust our work in the building. Where do we need additional support? Where do we need to change our routines? In addition, where would we need to intervene with a student? So, and then the second tier of intervention is when students are struggling with, given this level of rich educational opportunity, we have students who are struggling, then what evidence-based interventions are we using? And how are we then monitoring whether those interventions are effective or not? So this is where our work is lying right now, is improving um, our, instructional, our instructional program. So when, when you look at um, the district improvement plan, you will see um, goals that are specific to co-teaching and inclusion, which feeds the instructional, the tiered instructional model. You'll see that we are building in an enhancement block into each elementary student's schedule, a 30-minute block where students are either able to have academic intervention or be able to have the opportunity to go deeper into a concept that they may have mastered. Um, we have universal screening data that will be used to inform instruction, so you'll see goals specific to that work. You'll see um, alignment work around our curriculum, and you'll see at the elementary level at this moment, coaches to support in, um, improvement of instruction. Um, you're also going to see goals in this district improvement plan that are related to developing partnerships, as you've seen in the past, to improve our, our, our educational opportunities for students and goals related to improving communication within our schools and outside of our schools to the community, to families, and to the school committee. We also are reorganizing this year a bit internally um, so that I have a person who will address goals related to student achievement and accountability. This person will also be um, developing an, a comprehensive plan for community engagement so that, and, and family engagement. So families, we're actively planning on how are we going to have families feel connected to and able to access and participate in our schools to support their children. And we will have a person who will be entitled um, Director of Student Achievement and Accountability, which you see in your organizational chart. So you'll also see in the district improvement plan that the school committee goals are inserted into the document, which is what was discussed with the three chairs who've met with me over this process, and they are um, indicated in red, which I think we have um, color-coded copies for you. Um, and then we've also provided, um, 
as you've seen some progress on our goals from last year because while the purpose of this is to really look where we're going so partially so that you're evaluating my progress on implementing my goals but I thought that that would be really difficult to do without seeing some foundational information of what progress have we made so far um, in this past year so I'd love to just hand um, this document out which is the color-coded district improvement plan. So this is the same as in the packet, but color-coded? Yeah, I thought it might be easier. And right. there, well, there are some minor adjustments, too. I looked at some dates. I took off some typos and um, took the interim off my title. Rick? Yes. Sorry, while that's going around, can I ask a quick question about what you just went over? Of course. Can you explain what you mean by a guaranteed curriculum? I don't know what that means. What that means is that we understand what our curriculum is, that we have agreed to use certain curriculum materials, and that we understand the instructional model or the methodology of how we're going to teach. And it's guaranteed because we have methods to sample whether it's happening in classrooms. So we have whether that's walkthroughs or instructional rounds or through the use of teacher teams where teachers develop that collective commitment that we're teaching this now and this is how we're going to look at that so I see that as a guaranteed um, viable curriculum is that what you have on paper actually happens in the classroom Steve, I guess to follow up on that and I, I think this is a very nice nice plan I think you could have an equally elegant plan that was totally opposite in strategy and I'm just interested in outcomes but in terms of this type of guaranteed curriculum I can imagine having two teachers, same grade, a completely different approach, and it have been both been successful. You gonna force one of them to change? I'd be really interested to look at what how successful they've, they have been. I would like to look at student data to see that we are reaching each individual child, because it's very, um, we have exceptional teachers, and teachers do a great job in the classroom, and we're not meeting the needs of every single child in their classroom. So there have to be some standards that we have um, an expectation and understanding that we work within so that when interventions need to happen. Am I saying that every teacher teaches the same way? Absolutely not, because teaching is an art. But there have to be some consistent understanding so that when a student is struggling, you can identify why. It's not left up to chance of not knowing what's happening within closed doors. I guess at this point, from, from me, um, I also have staff here who are well um, ready to answer more in-depth questions. If there are questions other than, um, I'm really interested in hearing about your feedback on the district improvement plan. Is there something that's missing from your perspective or clarifying questions? Again, I'm working on timelines and I've been working on looking at evidence of how am I showing progress. Um, Dr. Guevara, who will be the Director of Student Achievement and Accountability, will be helping me. Um, as you'll notice on the last page, there are some um, dis DART um, student um, data indicators. Uh, Marta will be working with me around developing student outcome measures this year. So, so there's some things that are still in progress, but I'd love to know if there's anything that um, the committee would like to have either clarified or anything that you feel like from our discussions is missing from the document. And then if there are specific questions around action plans, if someone's here in the audience that can go down to um, micro questions, I'd be happy to do that or um, make sure we put things on an agenda for a future meeting. There's a lot here. So one thing we might do if, if you want is go page by page and just ask if you have any questions on a particular page. So really the, the bulk of this starts on page 11, I think. And I could, yes, Kathy. I actually have a question on page three. Okay. Yeah. This might be something that I missed, but I'm wondering about all these interims. Yes. And, and why we have interims and what the plan is. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I have reorganized to a certain extent within our um, central office. Joanne Smith's position, I have maintained as an interim because as it had been when I was doing interims, um, so what I would need to do is to be able to post the position at a period of time where Joanne would have an opportunity to apply if she chose to and other candidates would apply. So at this point, because she is an interim, there are other administrators that are also in an interim role underneath Joanne. Yes. So you're, the superintendent's not interim. No, why is that there? <laughs> I'm no, I corrected it in one. I apologize. <laughs> We've been moving a little too fast and furious. So that should be off as well as um, 
let's see. So it should be interim student services, student services administrator, special ed administrator. It should not be interim director of student achievement and accountability. I will clean that up, Kathy. Thank you. The director of achievement, student achievement, is not an interim. Correct. So the student services still is. Yes. And and so, so I guess I just have a question of. We should have a plan of how yes. long an interim lasts. Yes, and I intend to post the position this spring. Thanks. <laughs> Can I, can I ask a question? So are we, is this an additional administrative position? So we've added a director of achievement and no. accountability, and then we also now have, we're still going to have a director of student services? No, it was reorganizing internally, not adding an additional position. So maybe I should say any p questions on page four. <laughs> All right. Um, These are pretty consistent with the earlier document. That's the one with the red circles. Page six. Sorry. Yeah. So on page six. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't they all four overlap? Yes, they should. Okay. We worked on that a little bit. I, I can today. see it's, it's a little closer to all four overlapping than in the last one, but they're still not. All. It's the best we could do today. But, but just so that everybody knows, I mean, yes. really, they. They are all overlapping, and we have mechanisms to make sure the information is shared among, between. Yes. Page seven, that's the organizational chart. Rob. And the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment says two FTE. Is that two different people? At this moment, we have one director. However, I am actively and have been actively working with Amherst College to fund an additional administrative position, as I discussed with the committee um, last year, and we are very close to having that happen. So that's so, a proposed second FTE, but it would be funded from an outside source? Partially through outside source, partially through grants. Uh, page eight. Page nine. Page 10 called the district process goals. Page 11. Steve. Well, I guess, I mean, we had discussed at the Amherst meeting having math as a separate topic, and I think agreed to, and then it isn't on here as a separate topic. So is now the time to talk about math? It, it, if it, you, I would talk about math in the context of this, so there's math in here, so if you want to talk about an item on the plan. Yeah, I guess I'm a little disappointed that what we agreed upon didn't end up on the agenda as a committee. We didn't agree upon it. You asked for it, but I decided not to have it on the agenda because I thought this was too much to do in one meeting. Yeah, well, or perhaps it's not important enough, but I think it's important. It, and, and so I have a few questions about, about the, the math. If, if, sure, if it's related to this plan. Well, I mean, this is an up, I thought tonight we're doing an update that we're being updated on the progress of the district improvement plan, right? Well, that's after we talk about the, remember Kathy said we're switching to talk about the 11 and 12 plan first, and then Maria's gonna update us on last year's so plan. So you wanna wait for, so the question I would have for this year, and I think one of the things that was, that I found missing from effective leadership was sort of rigorous evaluation of teaching and programs. So, we're implementing a professional development plan that costs sort of in excess of $400,000 a year in math and literacy combined in the elementary schools. And I'm not sure, because that's the cost roughly of pulling six teachers out and having six replacement teachers, um, plus a math coordinator. And I'm not sure what the middle school and high school are doing or what Pelham is doing. But it seems to me that um, 
one, we have to rigorously evaluate whether that plan is effective, not in whether it feels good for teachers or administrators, but whether it's working. And um, because it involves pulling out some of our best teachers who are already involved on a day-to-day -day basis um, talking to colleagues. Um, but I think it also, we have to figure out, and, and I think as a committee note, what's going to happen to those teachers, particularly teachers lacking professional status, um, for whom the professional development is not working. And when we talked last time with Ms. Graham, Ms. Graham pointed to the limitations of, of our ability to evaluate teachers in the contract, which I'm not aware of, um, having read the contract. And I guess I'd like to know, given that even the most effective programs don't teach everybody, what the plan is to make sure that all the kids are getting very good instruction. I'd like to just speak to a piece of this. Um, we will be evaluating um, our coaching model. I'm, I am having conversations with um, various consultants and other people who can help us do that work, and we will be doing some internally. We need to look at all of our practices to see if they're actually being effective, because if they're not, we need to change that. In terms of evaluating specific staff, we do have goals within the district improvement plan because we will be looking to implement the state mandated evaluation um, process and that will take us um, this year of planning for, it doesn't relieve us of our obligation to evaluate staff now under our current model. However, we will be looking at the model this year because we will be implementing next, the following year. Um, so I don't see that that relieves us of our um, obligation to evaluate the program or the, the intervention strategy we're trying, and it doesn't re relieve us of our obligation to evaluate the effectiveness of our staff in terms of their teaching. And as you know, I mean, the standards, the, the regulations have changed in terms of what they're expecting of us for evaluating staff. Did anybody have any questions on page 11, any of those specific items? Debbie. It's kind of a follow up with that because I, actually that was one of the things that sort of struck me in, in general with the document is I'm also kind of struggling with how do you measure the effectiveness of these programs and I, I mean yeah as Steve says you need to measure good instruction but how do you measure good instruction and is there I'm just wondering if you have thought about mm -hmm. a year from now two years from now what are you going to look at to say, is this working or, or is it not working? Uh, part of the decision of creating the position of Director of Student Achievement and Accountability is to in fact do just that, to identify what are the outcome measures and student performance because everything we're doing should be shown in terms of the improvement of our children's scores. Um, individual children and their, their learning and their growing based on whether it's the math assessment, showing incremental growth um, three times per year within a classroom, or whether it's based on individual students' MCAS scores, or it's based on groups of students within classrooms, or groups of students within schools. We have to become much better at using this data and then um, creating outcome goals so that we can then hold ourselves accountable to. So um, I think the commitment to doing this work is by really putting a position, a person in place who will be on some level auditing us internally. Kathy? So in order to, to, to do that a year out or two years out, we need to be sure that before we start in these new programs that we have baseline data in the same way that we're going to measure yes. how things have changed. Because yes. if we have different data, it's not going to be a comparison. Right. And, and Marta, in particular, we, and I know Beth is saying we have that as well. Um, Marta has been looking at some of the data that we would want to look to um, compare between where we are right now and where we intend and hope to be and where we will be. So this is some of the, the last page. There are a number of different um, data points that we can take a look at, and um, she'll be helping us move in that direction. I guess, I guess to, to sort of chime in on Debbie's point, I think um, the best way to learn about these models is not to learn from ourselves. Because there's no way, there's no way we're going to be able to figure out whether a, an element of the changes we have made, the particular contribution of that element. We're seeing many, many changes in many areas. Um, there was 
an excellent random assignment, rigorous study done of both coaching and intensive professional development in literacy and mathematics done by a very high quality group which found that they were not effective at all. And I think it's unfortunate that, that we're not paying attention to the research. And just because there are feelings in some districts that they work, that's anecdotal and observational. And there were feelings in these districts too because people like them, but in the end they weren't shown to be effective. I think in terms of evaluating teaching, I think that's why you have very good experience principals. They go in and they should, you know, they're in the classrooms and they can evaluate good <coughs> teaching. And I think the fundamental change with the new evaluation regulations is that there's a requirement now to validate the observations made by an administrator with student outcome data. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's simple because they're teaching an MCAS tested subject. Um, it's not even simple with that because it's hard to, to, to identify the, the growth. Um, sometimes they're not so simple if they're in other subjects or grades. But I think the, the premise of what it means to be an effective principal and building leader um, in terms of making sure that we have high quality instruction hasn't changed. And I think the regulations, like all regulations, they're not the meat of the matter because you can do a good job with regulations or not such a good job. I think the meat of the matter is that, that we have a requirement from the top that permeates the whole system that what we demand is, is excellent teaching mm -hmm. and that if teachers and that and that we will provide teachers with very good feedback and if it doesn't get better to the point that we think is okay not just okay but very good because we get lots of applications for our jobs then something will be done and i think the evaluation is not put in place as a gotcha to get people out it's really put in place um, as a means of fostering improvement and I think an unfortunate notion has been this notion of evaluation is the opposite of collaboration. Mm -hmm. To me the only kind of productive collaboration occurs when there's serious evaluation and high stakes and, and I guess I don't see that as a central part of this plan. I say so. Um, I absolutely actually agree with you Steve around um, evaluation and I would suggest that true collaboration has um, a whole lot of tension involved with receiving feedback on your work by either your peers or the others sitting in the room with you. This is not for the faint-hearted to sit in a room and just talk happily about what they're doing. This is about really looking at how did the children in my classroom perform and what was my contribution to that and what am I going to change to make a difference. I think absolutely teachers need to be evaluated and if any of us are not doing our job we need to make some choices in our profession and we are coached to do so. I do think the district also has set a strong standard in the, in the period of time that I've been aware of what's happened in the new um, teacher induction program, I, which I witnessed the other day, starting with new teachers, stating the expectation that you will move from, from great to outstanding in three years. And this is, these are the expectations with having ongoing mentoring and induction, and um, our principals have been involved in those conversations and those actions with as well as Beth Graham. Um, and so I think the standard is set and now it's about us holding, holding the bar high because we don't have, we don't have time. So I, I actually agree with you, Steve, and I, but I see that I don't see that there's a difference, that there's such a divide between collaboration and evaluation that it's pinned against each other. I think that it's one and the same. It's all about improving the outcomes for students and you have to support staff and evaluate staff to do it. I had the um, privilege of setting in on a um, KIPP classroom um, about a month ago. Uh, actually, it was two of them, a third and fifth grade classroom. And one of the things that I was struck by was the um, after process, after the teaching had happened, mm -hmm. with the principal, because the principal was, was, was with me. Uh, the thing that struck me was that the feedback was targeted, specific, mm -hmm. and came and actionable. Right. It, in terms of what was really good, mm -hmm. what and what, what what really needed improvement. Things that I I had thought that both classroom teachers were excellent, and yet the principal went down through ten things. Mm -hmm that the classroom teacher didn't do that should have been done that would have improved instruction. Uh, you know, I believe that kind of feedback over time uh, with a teacher 
really improves. Now this school was dead set in the middle of Harlem um, and 99.9% uh, .9 of all students of color plus um, on, on free and reduced lunch. Um, and the achievement of that particular school was, uh, was off the charts in terms of its comparison mm -hmm. to uh, other schools uh, within New York City, within the suburbs, within the state. Mm -hmm. And if this is where we're going, that's where I want to go. That's where I would like to see us go. Um, the other thing was that um, teachers over time under that kind of scrutiny and who really did not really want to improve their practice uh, left the system quickly mm -hmm. because that kind of scrutiny um, is intense. May I? I also, I, I, it's exciting to be able to watch that in action because that's what makes a difference in the classroom when you are actually witnessing and giving real feedback, um, which is a, it's a skill to give real feedback that's meaningful and not just to kind of go over the surface with staff. Um, I also, um, believe that when you have teacher teams or teams of people who are working together, you're also using the expertise. You're honoring the profession of people who are exceptional teachers because they give really, they can on some level be much, and I mean this in a respectful way, but very tough on each other and critical of, the, of their own work and each other's work in a healthy way. So I think that this really not only use, it use, utilizes the internal resources that we have so that colleagues can feel professional, respected, and learn from one another. So it's not, you know, the principal and the assistant principal are one person. So you need a team of people that are all collectively in it and willing to, you know, go the distance and give each other feedback. Uh, any questions on page 12? Can I just ask one more on page 11? Um, so with the, uh, um, the last last item, mm -hmm. um, the 2010 evaluation of the special ed program, um, action plan updates, how, I'd like to see them more frequently than once a year. Sure, I think we have one scheduled, um, I can't remember when we have, I think very soon we have one scheduled and I'm more than happy to give updates whether that's within superintendent's update or have someone, because it's, it's not separate from all of our work, it's the tiered instructional model and it's all children, so it infuses into our work. So I'd be, I would be more than happy to, to make that happen. Steve? One, one more about math, and I think it's more appropriate now. One of Dr. Chen's main um, comments was that that there are, there, is, there are issues with subject matter knowledge and sort of fluency in mathematics and comfort in mathematics, which is impeding people from being effective teachers in many of our classrooms. And we received detailed comments on that. And, and I guess I have two questions. One is the coaching model does not address that. And I'm wondering what is being done. I understood that a few teachers were cajoled to go to get some extra work you know, take some classes, but I'm wondering in a comprehensive way how we're going to address that. And the second one is, I've spoken to some people who were on interview committees for jobs for this year, and it didn't sound like sort of at the elementary level, um, math knowledge was playing any role in that selection process. And we had talked last year about doing something to ensure that when we are hiring new teachers, we would explicitly try to make sure that, that the teachers were good in mathematics because that had been a well-identified problem. Um, and so I'm wondering what is the plan going forward to handle, to deal with each of these issues, both of which are related to subject matter knowledge. Um, I'll start and then I don't know if Beth or someone else wants to jump in with this as well. In terms of the selection process, I think that is a broad stroke to say that um, people were not examining um, applications, um, the courses that people took at, at a college level to look at mathematics because it absolutely has been a priority and the principals look at this seriously when they are interviewing staff. Whether there's been specific questions in the interview process and, and who you receive the feedback from, I don't know. Um, do I think we have to become more formal in terms of whether we're going to evaluate staff's mathematic uh, mathematical knowledge or just say that they have to have certain courses on transcripts. I do think we have to go there. Are we there yet? No. Um, in terms of math content, we were ex extremely careful about who was chosen as coaches. 
and the amount of time and thought that went into um, hiring stellar teachers who had strong content knowledge in English language arts and math um, was substantial. So we wanted to make sure that coaches are, are the people that a classroom teacher would say, I want to teach like that, and they have a knowledge base that will help me in an ongoing way in the classroom. In addition, when we look at teacher teams, we are going to be having teacher teams meeting together specifically around content. That's, it's critically important. Even attending one course is not going to necessarily translate to the classroom in a meaningful way. So we did, we did have a number of teachers, which I would suggest were not necessarily cajoled, because they went and they were really excited about taking graduate level courses and attending some workshops this summer, um, and did bring that information back, and we're very excited by it. Um, but around the, the specific comprehensive professional development plan around mathematics, I think would take some time, and, and I would ask um, Beth and the principals to, to speak to that more um, specifically. So I don't know if that's a time to go into it now or not. Great, thanks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm not really sure what question I should be answering right now, but in terms of professional development this summer, there were between 90 and 100 teachers in our school district who voluntarily participated in professional development in math specific areas. Of that, there were 15 uh, elementary teachers who attended the building computational fluency in mathematics, which is a content course in Northampton and nine teachers uh, participated in the spring graduate level course in math and knowledge for teaching. Um, so we really want to deliver content specific professional development to every teacher. It's our goal to do that. There are some plans in place for the fall, particularly the elementary level, with grade level teams, with grade level teams working with teachers, and um, you know, we're hoping that we're going to be able to accomplish cost district grade level <coughs> and band level content specific instruction in mathematics for the year. We share that goal. I guess it works. Yikes. <laughs> they can share one so you can take I know this one's been kind of funky too. That's okay. <laughs> Everyone's awake. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Beth. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? On? Yep. Sorry, I just had a question for Beth. Oh, Oops. sorry. It's really an, e it's an easy question. Okay. I'm just, I'm thrilled to hear that so many teachers have participated in professional development over the summer, and I'm wondering if that's part of what's going to happen on Friday that we're going to really celebrate and recognize the teachers who have have done this? Is there some way that other teachers can know also which teachers have participated in things so they can go to them with questions should they have them and as we have teachers that become more knowledgeable and experienced in different things that they can find each other across the district? Uh, at many of the elementary schools right now there are teams called math leadership teams so the information that people went off and learned about are, is being disseminated through the building and is driving um, the focus of the, I'm sorry, it's very weird. Going on. <laughs> yeah. It's dri at, you know, driving the professional development plans and the grade level team um, content specific support through the year. So I think I'm quite sure that people at the elementary level know who the go-to people are in the buildings. So. I think it would be really nice for those of us who aren't in the buildings also to know. Like the, and the families might want to know if they have particular questions. And You know what, that's a great idea. It might not be the classroom their child's classroom teacher they want to go to, mm -hmm. but we're talking about all these things so much and they're so important. And I, and I think that there is a lot going on. As much as you give updates in, in our meetings, Definitely. we don't really hear about what are the specific things. So if there's some way to document that for people to see and Sure. have access to them. That'd Thank you. Yeah, I, can I? Kathy had some great, uh, great suggestion in the conversation we had the other day was um, trying to make more accessible um, topics that are covered around professional development and having that information be transparent for the community and for 
teachers um, so that people not only can access information but have a, a greater sense of what's kind of happening oh, yeah. in the day to day. So it's like opening up and having a window into the schools. So I think it's a great suggestion. Okay, let's keep going through the plan. Uh, any questions on page 12, I guess? Everybody understand RTI all right? That's a pretty key part of all of this. And we're trying to stay right now with a tiered instructional model because I think people can get very connected to things like RTI or PBIS and it kind of, um, it can confuse people and it kind of helps people hang on to labels versus really talking about what they are. Um, I think Kristen might have had a question. I, I, was <coughs> I was trying to figure out why I circled it. Um, but I think, so the, the universal screening has been done K to six at this point or will be done at this point will be done this year. And then it's, I'm trying to figure out when the universal screening is complete across yeah, let me all look. the schools and when it will be implemented. It looks like it's implemented into the secondary in, by 2012, but when is the universal screening being? Oh, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna pass to Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Because I think through middle school as well. Mike Hayes may also want to say something about middle school use of the data. Right, so, uh, I know. all right. Yeah. Um, Might be because that other one is still underneath. Yeah. And it, it's gonna yeah. Stand. I got it. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so we started last February. So um, the way the universal screeners work is that it happens three times a year so you can track growth. Um, so we did do a winter session just for math for grades two through six last year, and that was because when we got involved with, with NWA, which is the organization that's working with us on this, um, and then they have certain, because it is a norm referenced assessment, there's certain time periods that it has to be done by. So we just couldn't squeeze, we didn't want to throw, disrupt the school to get our first data point. Um, so we did focus on math, and we did focus on grades two through six, and then in the spring we did do K to six, both reading and math. Uh, what's really neat is for the students in grades two through six in math, we now have two data points, which eventually need a lot more, but that we're able to really see growth uh, or lack thereof, and then come to some conclusions about it. So that's the exciting part. It's not the first one where we get a score; it's really to assess things over time, so we see how's the instruction and the interventions working for our students. Um, so the idea this year, now that we're kind of caught up in the process is to go one through six math and reading three times a year. For kindergarten students, based on their readiness and, and variety of other developmental factors, we're gonna use a spring, and the fact that we screen them before they even come to us um, using a different measure. We're just doing a spring screening for kindergarten, but for one through six, we'll have a, a fall one, which is roughly kind of early October. Uh, a winter one should be a little more like January, February, and the spring one, which is late in the school year. Could I also have Mike, can you speak to the middle school just for a minute, please? Good evening. Uh, so we started, we did our first map assessment in the spring last year. Uh, we did math and reading. Uh, it replaced uh, our DRP, which we were using degrees of reading proficiency, which we've been using previously. Um, and we did not have a universal screening for mathematics. So uh, one of the things that we're doing this year is in the past week, we've started putting together all the data that we are gotten from the elementary schools, plus our data for the seventh grade. So um, on the curriculum day, uh, Thursday for the middle school, we're actually gonna spend the whole afternoon where we'll be broken up by teams and we'll be actually looking, we have a spreadsheet that's gonna have the, um, for the incoming seventh graders, they now have a winter and spring score. We also have our MCAS score and we have our transition sheets. So for the first time in mm -hmm. my recorded history at, at the middle school in the 15 years, we're actually gonna be looking closely at where kids are at before we even see them. Um, when previously, when we were just using MCAS, we would be into October, November before we really start look, sitting down. So, so it'll give us a jump start. And, and also over the last year, and I'll talk about this when I talk about the school improvement plan at the middle school, um, we have several interventions now in place. The VELA program that we've been working in collaboration with Amherst College, we're now bringing that so it'll happen during the day as well. Um, and then the academic study uh, period that we ended in last year. So we're gonna be able to use that 
also in combination, maybe haven't gotten to it on the improvement plan yet, but um, we're piloting Renzuli, which is a gift and talented for all um, type program. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to use that within that specific intervention time, both for students who need support, but, but also students who are ready to, to fly at a higher level. And then I can also just briefly tell you the high school. So what happens with, with these map assessments that kind of peter out in terms of effectiveness and in terms of how high they go. So we are, all our eighth graders took the math and reading. So Diane Chamberlain, assistant principal at the high school, um, she's going to be looking at that data. And one of the things they're going to do is, is particularly looking at the students that they now have coming in identified, um, concerned about not working at grade level, that they can now use um, this assessment in a targeted place. So it won't be for, say, the, I don't know what the exact percentage are, but the 75 to 85 percent of kids who are already kind of maxed out the effectiveness of that particular assessment. Um, but then focus on the kids that are already coming in that we're concerned about, you know, the, the kids that we'd be concerned about passing um, the 10th grade MCAS. So it, it's kind of permeating up through the, through the grades already. And could I, could I just add sure. on? Mm -hmm. Also, I just wanted to say for the elementary level, also um, teachers this year will have in their hands before school starts the performance of the classroom that they had last year to inform their instruction. So where do they see that, you know, their students in, by strand? Um, they, their instruction really worked well and kids, you know, soared, or where do they really need to look at their um, content and maybe how they were instructing? And they will have the information around the students who will be sitting in front of them so that th that information both years will inform their instruction. So they will have that this year, which is the first. Yeah, so I was able to actually preview yeah. that today and Doug Slaughter has been putting that together. Uh, for us in in basically a teacher will be able to see you know for at the middle school will be for their hundred kids at the elementary school for the 25 um, they they'll be able to see and it's not just their overall raw scores but it's also how they did on each um, mm -hmm. each problem and the way Doug's laying out visually you'll be able to very easily go through and see for your group of students you know what what particular types of problems they were struggling on as a whole class but then also looking at the individual students. So it's going to add another layer on the MAP testing and MCAS raw scores, give us one layer, and then being able to do this. We, once we start to raise questions about particular students, we can start to use this type of analysis to dig a little bit deeper into, into what types of supports we do in these intervention times. Catherine. Yeah, uh, so Mike, and then are you going to do these assessments? Mm -hmm. you, at what? So yeah, so we do them, we're going to do them three times. So, we, also, yeah. so we start our first one actually is late September into the first week of October. They set these times, and then one in January, one at the end of the year. Um, so essentially, what we'll do is we're starting this master file, and as we do each one, we get to to add on this new, and we're going to really be able, as Mike was saying, be able to see that progress or lack of progress um, mm -hmm. over time, and then being able to make uh, the the part that's exciting to me is. It's, it's really around for what it tests for, because let's be clear, it doesn't test for everything. Right. Um, but for what it does test for, it's going to give us um, an ability to recalibrate what we're doing to see whether it's effective or not uh, at several times throughout the year. Right. Kathy and Kristen. So I have a question. It, it, it's not to you, Mike, but it, it includes you. And, and Marie, you and I have actually talked about this. And right. I have a question about the process of the administration mm -hmm. of these assessments and the evaluation that's being done around the process and the input that we're getting from teachers about how it's going and from students about how it's going and how we're comparing that among the schools and the grades and how we're responding to that because mm -hmm. it's all fine and good to talk about the data that we're getting from it but then the validity of the data based on what the process of the administration is. So, so I think it's important to sure. talk about that. And what I said to Kathy before is that we absolutely are working out the kinks. The first time you're trying to administer an assessment tool when you haven't done that before, it's like, how do you even go about doing this? Who's monitoring and making this happen? You know, how are we explaining this to children? What happens when, when children need additional support through the process? So I know building principals are getting feedback from the specific um, administrations that have been happening. Also, Jerry's um, staff, instructional technology. Thank you. We've changed the name recently for the past year or so. Um, teachers have been helping and like critically important in the administration. So they also are the holders of lots of information and feedback. So I would suggest to Joanne, who has been holding RTI, to really kind of look at a, a little bit more of a formal 
kind of gathering of data to see where we need to tweak some of our so I would just add to that also Please. that so the spreadsheet that I'm talking about, one of the things we're going to start doing is cross-correlating MCAS scores to MAP scores. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also be able to add in grades. We're going to be able, able to add in the kind of qualitative information we're getting um, out of the classroom from teachers. So because that is a concern of ours is we don't want to say, you know, some, so our only administration right now, it was in the spring after we had done MCAS, mm -hmm. everybody was worn out. So we we're already feeling like we don't want to take that as a single data point and say, oh, well, now you're going to need this program based on that. So, which is why we're, we're um, already adding in the MCAS and looking at, as I said, the, the other pieces. Um, and I think that's going to be something over time that we'll get a better read on. And one of the things that I've been talking to staff about as well is at the middle school, it's very appropriate um, to start engaging students in this is what your scores are, these are where your strength, these are where your struggles. And so they start to see the, that, that when they're taking the time to take these tests, that it actually has an effect on them knowing where they are and then the type of programming we set for them. So, so I think that that's going to build over time as well. I just think it's important that it goes across the schools, it's consistent in how we're doing it in the different schools and people are, are talking about that we're doing that. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. Kristen? Um, I was just trying to think about connecting to what Debbie and Steve had been talking b about earlier in terms of how do you know when you have good teaching and we're trying to figure out what are the outcome measures, will these be an aspect of that? Is that your intention? The, the outcome the measures that, for around teachers specifically, this is, we're very new in that conversation because we do have to have a committee including teachers and, and administration sitting together and really looking at what would be considered part of that evaluation process. So we really haven't even be, begun walking down the road about how would we, what information would we use, what would we not use um, in evaluating staff. But that will be this year. So we should keep moving on this plan and get on to uh, a summary of last year's plan. Any questions on 14 and 15? Steve? You can ask one, I'd like one more question on this page that I can't yeah. read. <laughs> um, We've had, we've identified, I think, last year, and it's something we're, a great concern of ours over the years has been the, the race and um, ethnic gaps and, and disciplinary mm -hmm. infractions. I think that our, any kid dropping out, I, I think, is a, of concern. Mm -hmm. The higher dropout rate among special ed kids, I know, is of concern of kids of color, of disadvantaged kids. And, and I think we haven't to date gone and tracked these kids backwards. Mm -hmm. See how they were doing. See when the disciplinary infraction started and the troubles academically. Mm -hmm. And I think we should do that going backwards for the current groups of kids or the recent cohorts of kids who just graduated. And I think we need to do it going forward so that we can really see whether these new programs are working. I mean, once again, it's easy to say, wow, it's working. We're sort of implementing it with fidelity. But to know what's working, I think we're going to have to see some improvements both academically and socially. Um, because I can imagine a number of current and former teachers and intervention people hating what, what we're doing now and saying what we used to do was really great, you know, the sort of old therapeutic models were really great and, and wouldn't like what we're doing now, which is more standard. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they were claiming that what they were doing was really great without evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think we need, and I know we're collecting a lot more data, but I think that systematic reporting of this to us as a committee, um, including breakdowns by race and ethnicity, and linking it over time so we see that how are the kids doing as they, as they go through our system would be really valuable. And I hope they're part of the plan. It absolutely is part of the plan and one of the challenges we have is looking backwards is that our data isn't clean in lots of ways to be able to make some sort of an assessment as to did the interventions we tried work because we were not documenting in the same way um, historically around discipline data, interventions. We were not consistent necessarily at, across the elementary schools of if X infraction happens, we will be using a consistent approach. So that's a lot of what we're doing is really norming our expectations of how we will um, intervene with kids, but also how do we document that so that we really can be more objective in, in terms of our being responsible for making a difference for kids. Debbie. Yeah, I had a question along similar lines. One of the, when we talked about the discipline data, 
in the spring, we had a, I thought, a good conversation about the need to improve or create a more positive school and cl climate, better engagement in the classroom for kids of color. Mm -hmm. And there was a gentleman, I don't remember his name, I'm sorry, who, who just spoke during public comment and talked about there was a lot of research out there, you know, talking about strategies that could be used. And I, I kind of hope to see maybe that we had are investigating those strategies and, and maybe are actually putting strategies in place and that, um, and maybe that's the high school school, I, I don't know. I, May I? Yeah. Um, we absolutely are, and that was Michael Burkhart who spoke. Right. Um, yes, we are, and part of the work that Marta um, began with the inquiry um, equity group, um, which has made some specific recommendations that the principals will be reviewing. It's been it's on our agenda right now to really look at some of the areas that we've identified as barriers for um, specific groups of students, um, and. Also, are, do we have, if in certain cases there aren't barriers, but we have students who are not benefiting from, and what is that about? And Marta, I know historically through MSAN has um, been involved with some of Ron Ferguson's work, which is a tripod project, which gives you some very specific um, steps you can take to make improvements in your school district. And I know through some of the work that Beth um, and the administrators and teachers leaders just um, discussed in one of their coaching institutes was specifically Ron Ferguson's work. So we are absolutely taking steps right now, which Marta will be um, developing action plans for the district that will be um, attached to the goal that has to do with, uh, let's see, Safe, positive learning environment. develop and implement strategies for achieving equal access to educational and other opportunities regardless of race or class. Okay. And as well as around PBIS, um, we're, we're much more able to actually look at that data and make, try interventions. And then we have to be held accountable, did it work? Um, so we will be extremely specific and be happy to report that back to the committee. Great. Thank you. So just in relation to that, where you were on page 13, number C, and what Steve was talking about in your comment, it seems like it may be under the resources needed that part of in addition to the baseline information mm -hmm. that we're talking about integrating in some historical data as well to help to see it in perspective? Which, which we have in our equity group, but we will be incorporating that. So thank That's you, I'll put that in. There. Yep. Okay. Anything else on this year's plan? Okay, why don't we move on to a discussion of last year's plan and, and um, you can Wait, just, um, um, page 17, yep. yes. and, which I consider to be one of the most important parts of this document mm -hmm. um, because here's where we start looking at measurement. And it's measurement that is really important uh, in relationship to everything that is going on. Mm -hmm. Everything that we've seen before in the district improvement plan all comes down to this DSE do uh, document, this DART document. Uh, and the school system is committed to having this as part of its evaluation process in terms of all of what we've been hearing. And, and it's important to note that this, is, this data goes across several areas mm -hmm. uh, and will include all the other data points that are out there. Um, so for me, I look at this and think this is the um, probably one of the most important part of this document in terms of all the questions that have been raised about measurement and evaluation. Mm -hmm. One thing before moving on, maybe we can say we'll have all this up on the website and maybe a link oh, on yeah. the homepage to it. Yes, well, every, okay. everything will be up on the website and a link as it was last year and we'll just continue to put this information up for the community as well. Okay, hey, for so, last year's plan, do you want to just walk us through it? Well, I guess the question, the goals are not terribly dissimilar. I did change some wording to make, I think, the, the plan clearer. Um, so our goals now are based on the foundational work around mathematics um, program evaluation and implementing the action plan, starting the science evaluation and where we are within the science evaluation. Um, I also have updated information on 
um, the anti-bullying work, which the committee's heard um, quite a bit about, um, and positive behavioral intervention and supports, which is the tiered instructional model. I apologize that there are not page numbers on this document. It would have made it easier. Um, so, which we've discussed much of today. So we, as you know, we piloted um, PBIS at Crocker Farm, and we will be now moving um, incrementally toward the other elementary schools and up through middle school, high school, where applicable. Um, we also are looking at school-wide enrichment, which is what Mike uh, mentioned around the middle school, which is identifying students' strengths and talents, and then being able to use that information to gear um, um, instruction in that direction. You also see um, goal number three, which is data analysis. We've spoken a lot tonight around the, the levels of data that we are using and how we are integrating that into um, our work. Quite honestly, this plan reflects um, using data to inform instruction. Also, we have spoken um, over the past year of how we use data to inform a budget process. So we are continuing that work. Rob worked very closely with the budget subcommittee last year to um, create a comprehensive spending plan, and we will be adding to and updating that plan again this year for you. Um, I found we were, in my opinion, we were less effective about when we had like a separate data team where we did not infuse it into the educational conversation because we didn't have the right voices in the room. So we can talk about um, data separate from instruction, but then we weren't we weren't making the links, I think, that would really move us forward. So we're not holding a separate data team. It's all connected to um, teaching and learning, so our district instructional leadership team. In terms of goal area four, which is around um, attracting diverse staff, supporting, challenging, um, providing a challenging focus of professional development, I created, um, I included a great deal of um, information around creating that engine, that vehicle that we spoke about, the district instructional leadership teams, school teams, teacher teams. Um, mentoring induction program we touched on briefly. And effective communication, a number of different strategies we've, we've tried this year. I'm actually interested in looking to see how effective they've been, and I'm not really sure how to go about doing that. So while we've used ACTV, Amherst Media quite a bit, um, I'm interested to see how many people are actually watching as a beneficial, so I have to think about how to get that information. Um, also, the informal meetings with the superintendent, some were well attended, some were not. Um, part of Marta's work this year will be to consider how do we actually engage the community in a more meaningful way, because clearly just having meetings at the school level and say, come who wants to come is not necessarily the most effective means, so we need to be out in the community. So I think it would be great if we had some way to get feedback on the different things that you're doing rather than, I don't think attendance even means it's good right. or bad right. by itself. And, and if there was some way to have something that, like the high school had at orientation yesterday for, or Monday for students, they fill a quick little thing out. What do we want to know about the effectiveness of it and so right. we can respond to it and make changes? And also with the ACTV, I mean, I think it'd be great if there's some way to, if somebody watches it, Right. For them to then give some response about, you know, who they, who are the, de what are the demographics also? Like, who are we reaching with the ACTV, mm -hmm. and how are, you know, why are they doing watching it, and what do they think about it? Sure, that'll take me a little bit of time to think about how to do it, but I, I absolutely agree. You know, and I know counters are not just, an, it's just not enough information. Right, it tells you how many people are accessing, but not necessarily to benefit. And who? Um, and then also, as uh, you see, engaging and supporting the Special Education Parent Advisory Council um, goal, and you see some updates there in terms of what um, collaborative work we, we worked with together, as well as informational flyers we supported and, and such. Um, and then um, some examples of partnerships. Um, Which goal are you on? Six. I'm sorry. Yes, it is um, goal number five still. Community. I have a question on five. Oh, please. Kathy. So, so on the part about the ombudsperson, I think it would yes. be great to have data on how that went, you know, like how that person was used and, and how many people, what they used, and again, what they, the value of it to the people that used it. And I think that would be a great suggestion, and I'm actually meeting with Barry um, this week. 
this week and I can start to gather some of that information. I'm also considering how are we going to use his time this year. We're going to continue with community and family, um, connecting with community and family. But are there, is there a role for Barry to be connected in other ways if his time isn't being maybe fully used in that way? Um, because he has so many areas of expertise. So we will be talking about that. I'd be happy to report back on, on that as well. Um, so, and then I talked about partnerships, after school programming, um, partnering with the town, um, five, uh, the five college superintendents advisory. I, I won't go through each, but a number of examples around partnership, attempts at partnerships we've made this year. And then I just included a few other updates that I thought would be important for the committee to have around other projects and initiatives that might not be directly related to goals. But um, as I was typing this up, I thought I would add a few other things that would be helpful for you to know about our work. So just a general statement. Thank you for putting this together. I mean, it's, it was obviously a lot of work, and I, I think it just demonstrates that there has been a lot of good work that's, that's been happening. So I, I really appreciate having this. To, um, as, as reference. And then I have a really, really quick question for sure. you. Sure. On the K-12 science review, mm -hmm. about two of the three team members for the outside review have been identified and secured. What does that mean? We're trying to bring in a team of evaluators. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Right, we're looking to bring in a team of evaluators um, to look at different aspects of the program and then to develop a, comp uh, a comprehensive and composite review of, of recommendations. And so actually the update says two of the three have been secured. It looks like at this point it will be two. Okay, so are these like uh, paid consultants? Yeah, they'll be paid, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more follow-up question? And when will they be here working with us? We're looking at October, and so it's either the beginning of October or the end of October. I, I'm sorry to be vague about it. One of the considerations is that a key person in the high school science department is on leave at the beginning of the year, and we really want her voice as part of the recommendation, so as part of the review. So we're trying to schedule the um, the consultants you know and uh, this teacher it's time to um, to be to best leverage or maximize the conversation that we're going to have around science you're welcome Can I? Maria? Uh, um, do, also I'm just kind of interested in the committee does this and, and it doesn't have to be now but I would be very interested in receiving feedback on the format that if there's a different format or if the links are a good thing or if you'd prefer hard copy, I was trying to save, you know, trees in this. Yeah, so just, you know, when you get down to the progress, which I would be hoping to, to complete a self-assessment for the formal evaluation process, it would be helpful for me at some point if the committee would reflect on the format of this document, if it was helpful or not. Okay, so I'd love that feedback. Yeah, I, and, and I certainly will, and I would also like to echo what Debbie said. This is, looks like an enormous amount of work. It's very informative, and um, I really appreciate it. I, I really feel like I have, you know, the information um, all in one place, which was really great. And I and I particularly like the links because then I could sort of pick and choose and go, and and it, and it was all there. So thank you. This is really um, quite comprehensive. Yeah. A um, couple of questions um, regarding, I'm not sure what page is. Uh, I know, I'm but, sorry, Kim. Yeah, that's okay. The, um, the item Center for New Americans and ARPS Partnership and the Family Outreach. Yes. And how that um, uh, does or does not dovetail with the action plan to raise literacy. Um, questions about the grant to the Center for New Americans. That's a one-year grant. Correct? No, I believe it's a three-year grant. Three I can check that with you, but I believe it is a three-year grant. Um, it was. This was the first year. This was the first year. Yes. Okay. So I can. Be, I'd be happy to give you an update. Um, youngsters are. It's a walk-in. It's recommended. Um, how, how do you approach the clientele for this program? Parents are are connecting with the Center for New American around their language courses, 
And when they are attending language courses, the children are there receiving um, early literacy um, instruction from a preschool teacher. So it's really connected to the adult education, but again, it's dovetailing connecting um, the school work of early intervention with the parents' literacy work. Is, is there a cutoff um, age requirement, or age? Oh, I wanna say three. Do, do you remember, Annie? Um, I will check for you. I'm sorry? Where it ends for the age of children? Is that what you were? I want to say school age. I want to say once children are in school, they're not coming for that intervention. But I'd be happy to get a comprehensive update are for you. Are at all, and the staff involved at all with this? We have a staff person that um, was hired um, to work on behalf of us on, in the grant. So we did go through the hiring process to identify the teacher. So yes, they're technically our staff, but supported through the grant. And is there a relationship between that program and the family outreach in terms of reaching out to parents who might not be aware of the need for the literacy program? Well, Family Outreach of Amherst, I don't believe, has their hand in that program specifically. Um, but in terms of um, parent outreach, I could check. I'm really, truthfully, not sure about how um, um, the Center for New American goes, Americans go about uh, making those connections. I know they're ter they're very well connected in the community, but I don't know how about how they actually go about doing that. Not to the degree that staff or anyone else connected with the district is going actually into homes. No. No. Nope. Is that thought about? It hasn't been, but um, years ago we did have um, uh, we had piloted a program, Birth to Three. I know I'm going to blank on the name. Does anyone remember what that program was that Jerry had in place? Parents as teachers. Parents as teachers. And at that point it was, thank you, Debbie, was funded where we had outreach, um, former educators, current educators who went into homes to work with parents around um, working with their babies through, I believe it was through age five. Um, and that also was a nice link to connecting to preschool. But again, we did not have um, grant funding for and um, when budgets became tight. So I would be very interested in looking at early intervention again. One, one last question. Of course. Uh, what, what, if any, is the relationship between those two programs and your action plan? Were you going to talk about that? This um, they are not connected in terms of a specific goal other than developing partnerships which benefit um, our students entering school um, in any way prepared for um, to benefit from preschool and kindergarten. So it is about mutually beneficial work. So when we look at um, the Center for New Americans, or we look for partnering with the Survival Center, um, it's my belief and it's the belief of, I believe all of our educators is that, um, I know it sounds corny, but it does take a village and we have our doors open between certain hours and if we don't extend past that in some way to partners with other, partner with others who have um, different roles in the community, we're missing, we're missing a huge opportunity. Um, our, our families, access the survival center, our families access Center for New Americans, and if we're not making those links and connections, um, I think we're more powerful if we actually partner together to make that happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Catherine. Yeah, um, one thing I might add to this is the community mapping uh, task force. Right. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, and I don't have the update from the last meeting that you all attended, uh, but the community mapping is looking at um, strengths within our community, specifically Amherst to start, and we would hope that we can move into Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury, but to start with mapping the strengths in the community, the resources, and also identifying gaps in resources. So w who are our families in Amherst? And um, are they able to and are aware of accessing the services? And then how do we bridge um, gaps. So how do we partner with the Center for New Americans, the Human Service Network providers, um, the town of Amherst to put all the data out on the table and say here's literally a map of our resources and our families who need those resources and um, having the real conversation about are we, are we okay with that we may not have resources in our community for people who, who need them. And I think that you know the, the conversation around the community mapping group is Let's put it out there, and then it's something that our community has to grapple with. Yes, we have a hand in, because we have a responsibility, and as well as the rest of our community. Yep. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Just one comment, I guess, on, on this literacy issue. Um, 
During the past year and a half, there's been a considerable amount of discussion um, regarding the math program, K through 12, um, and what we should be teaching, what we shouldn't be teaching, and the conversation around that particular topic has been um, endless. Um, I'm of the opinion that um, regardless of how good or how knowledgeable the teacher is regarding math, mm -hmm. unless a youngster is literate, um, it's not going to really matter. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that the devotion that we spend on, on math is equalized, if not exceeded, by our attention to making sure that every kid um, past third grade is capable of reading and writing. And I know that's an elementary issue, not a secondary issue. But it seems to me that it, the chickens come home to roost in the secondary level. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I don't think we've had enough discussion about that. I, I would love to have more of a discussion around that topic because it happens to be a passion of mine. Because if we are exceeding a certain grade level, the window closes pretty rapidly around, um, around um, children with ease learning to read. And then it becomes a whole host of other issues for children. Um, and we have actually been engaged in a substantial amount of work around um, literacy in our school district to the point of saying how much time needs to be spent literally during the elementary schedule around literacy. And I would expect, um, and I, I not expect, I would also suggest that this is all of our issue. While it is elementary from a, a certain perspective, it is all of our issue, and that's lots of our conversations at the district level, that these are all of our children. And if we, we don't meet that need early on, um, we all sit with this issue. So I'd love to have that conversation. Um, I just want to wake up Mark with this one. Um, um, <laughs> last year, there was, uh, at one point, considerable discussion uh, about uh, perception, teachers' perception in race. Uh, and I hope that we um, will uh, be addressing that uh, because it specifically came up. It was talked about, uh, it was newspaper, et cetera. But you know, w one of the things that um, is, would be a really great goal and an objective mm -hmm. of this uh, school system is that we don't have kids feeling as if they're being treated differently. Mm -hmm. And that we address that head on and that we don't just pay lip, lip service to it, but we address it in, in very meaningful ways. I totally agree with you, Irv, and I know Mark's gonna wanna talk a little bit about some of the work the high school's been focusing on. So when I was here in the spring, uh, to talk about race in the context of discipline data. I talked about the project we had undertaken with the MSAN kids. Um, I to told you that we had uh, reprised the conversation from the previous spring that they had had in anticipation of going to the MSAN conference. And just to, just to re recap that, um, in my judgment, that was one of the most uh, moving, provocative things that I've sat through in 30 years, listening to, to kids of color talk about what their experience has been uh, in a predominantly white organization. So we reprised it in the spring. We took an hour of footage. We edited it down. Um, kids have a lot of things to say about a wide range of issues, what it means to live in the community, how difficult it is to get, the job, to get jobs in the community, to how exchange programs are conducted, the state of the curriculum, their, their range is broad. For the purposes of the opening of school, though, what I did was edit it down to have their comments focused on two issues, on how they feel, just to follow Irv's comment, how they f what, what, what it feels like day to day to live in a building where they, uh, um, uh, where they are a, st a statistical minority and all that means given the history of the country. And at the same time, and the second issue we focused on was uh, their sense of the, uh, the expectations that people have and how they're held to them. So our, my thinking was that those are two good issues to focus teachers on in the beginning of the year to organize and to begin to organize their thinking around. So today we had the new teachers in and we showed this. So this was the uh, the debut, if you will. Um, so Herb had asked Maria to make sure that I got a copy. This is our, uh, this is Rick's copy. Um, and so tomorrow or Thursday when we meet with the faculty. Um, I'm going to lay the plan out for them, and it's going to be, and I think I, I referenced this when I was here last time, that what we're not going to do is the, 
is the off-the-rack one-size-fits-all, uh, putting 120 people in an auditorium and uh, raising the issue of race is, uh, is a prescription for uh, an unproductive time. So we're going to try to do it a little differently. I'd rather talk to them on Thursday about it before I talk to you in terms of the mm -hmm. specifics. I'd rather them not have to see this on television. Right? I'd rather talk to them directly. But we showed it to the, um, the new teachers today. And interestingly, we combined it with the article that Beth had used in our training last week by Ron Ferguson. Um, and that's a, that's a, he's got a very, very strong typology about how uh, particularly white middle class people should go about thinking about what it means to organize their relationships with kids of color in an academic setting. And I'd love to come back and talk about that at some point, but for right now you should know that, Rick, here's your copy. Okay. Um, I also, if I could, just add on to, thank you so much, Mark. Um, also at our district level meetings, we have topics on our agenda each time we're meeting that are specific to issues of equity, to the point of policies, practice, um, things related to field trips, even to the point of bake sales. Because there are equity issues embedded in all of the work that we do every day, and we have to be able to surface these issues um, and have real conversations about them. So we are working on practicing um, what we preach at the district level and holding ourselves accountable. So we would be happy to report back. Steve? Just some, uh, something related and, and to extend the conversation about math a little bit more. Um, so there, I think there are two issues from the, the work on mathematics uh, this year. Uh, one of them is related to race. Uh, actually, they, they both probably are. And that is, I think th that um, there's a lot of disappointment in the community in the choice uh, of the elementary school math curriculum, um, which hasn't been discussed in a meeting. And, and I guess my concern is that the best evidence shows that the type of curriculum that, that we're using investigations, which is, doesn't do so much modeling and showing problem solving, um, it's more about discovery, has been shown not to be effective, um, particularly for disadvantaged kids. My view is one of the reasons for that, that it really focuses on disadvantaged kids, is because advantaged kids have a lot of options to learn at home and to learn in other places. And that modeling problem solving um, would appear to be a better, uh, more effective way for children to learn math, not only the specific problems they see, but learn to be able to, to, to develop strong analytical skills. And I think I, I have a lot of concern about the way um, the decision was made um, with regard to the textbook. Um, the second one is, is IMP. I think the committee voiced its recommendation for a serious evaluation of IMP. It's straightforward since we have kids from across the seventh and eighth grade MCAS distribution. Some chose IMP, some chose traditional math. Um, I'm really disappointed that wasn't done. Um, and, and I think it's a particular concern because I understand that there may be a movement afoot that IMP becomes our math curriculum, um, perhaps not in name, and that we move to a math curriculum in the high school where <coughs> students only have one choice and there's not division by level of preparation. So. I guess in those two things, I'm concerned about what we did to our math instruction, those decisions, and particularly for disadvantaged children. Mark, did you want to respond to something? I did. I'd like to talk to Steve a little bit. So Steve, I, um, before I got in the business of being a high school principal, I was a middle school principal, and I was a middle school principal in an urban area, and with... Uh, the middle school version of IMP, Connected Math. Uh, we raised math scores uh, dramatically over the course of three year period. So I'd be real interested in what research you're looking at about the mismatch between urban kids and Connected Math. Because in my experience, it was the single best thing we ever did to raise their scores. So I offer that to you just as a way to begin the year. If the conversation is gonna go that in, in that direction, I think, We'd want, to, we'd want to lay out the full range of perspectives on it. The second thing is, I just want to point out an irony, and it might be a good thing to talk about at the beginning of the year as we frame the discussion for the, for the remainder of the year. <clears throat> the traditional math sequence, algebra one, algebra two, geometry, or algebra one, geometry, algebra two, precalculus, calculus, has never been vetted in any kind of scientific way by anyone. What it has going for it is a long-standing tradition. Conversely, IMP has been rigorously vetted 
by the National Science Foundation and is one of the five national curriculums that in their judgment best approximates the NCTM and now the Common Core. So it's curious to me that when we talk about uh, rigorous evaluation of math, we don't talk about the thing that has, been, has gotten off scot-free. And what we focus our discussion about evaluation on is the thing that has been most rigorously evaluated. So I'm just trying to make it complicated. Hopefully I've succeeded, thanks. Can I just, let me clarify, because I, I didn't really mean evaluation of IMP. I speak incorrectly. I meant comparison of our two programs. We have an opportunity to compare our two programs, <coughs> horse race, fair start, and we chose not to do that. So I misspoke by saying IMP, we had a horse race. I, 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 I hear you, what you said about your middle school, um, mathematical policy research it has conducted the only random assignment study where s different schools and districts were assigned different mathematics curriculum. So how about this? In the interest of time, oh. let's focus on the high school, because that was just really an editorial comment on my part. I'm really interested well, in No, no, no. I think for people in general, let me just say that there was one random assignment experiment, scientifically rigorous, not a perspective on your school, and you may have been doing a lot of things in your school, or connected math may have worked well in your school. There's one scientifically rigorous study, and it showed that um, investigations did far worse than the other curriculum did, significantly worse in a, in a statistical sense. So I'm sorry I misspoke about the high school. I just think we had a great opportunity to actually compare at a level playing field the two curricula with high stakes outcomes, and we, we've chosen not to do it. So l l let me say two things, and we all gotta get home. So one is that, um, so over the last, I would say probably a year and a half, there's been lots of aspersions cast on IMP. And the point that I simply want to make right now is that's ironic because the data is very overwhelming that IMP is a very worthwhile road to go down in terms of, in terms of mathematics. So I didn't hear you say that, but if we're going to go down this road a little further, I just want to note that. I disagree completely. Okay. Lots okay. of people uh, right I'm under almost, the NSF, I'm almost none finished. of those are scientifically I'm rigorous studies. I'm almost finished. Okay. Okay. And you made me forget my second thing. Ah, it was going to be good. Just a, just a couple more comments on this. Uh, <laughs> shoot, well, I, I would all right, I'll come back. Yeah, because I, 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 I wanted to re respond to this. I'd like to request the chair. Oh, I do. Can, can I do one more thing? I remembered my point. No, because the conversation will just continue. And I would request of the chair that we move on with the agenda, that this is not the appropriate time for this conversation. With all due respect. That's fair. This is not the appropriate time for this discussion. I'd like to be invited back. Move then. on with the agenda, please. Okay. Thanks. It's a good idea to move yep. on anyway. Yeah. I, I think it's really important, though, because Steve said something, and this is the second time he said it, and I don't, I mean, I want to know, is there truth in it or not truth, because this is how rumors get spread, that IMP is going to become the only math program in the high school. Is that, in fact, any, is there any basis in reality in that statement? So are we going to continue or are we not going to continue? Because if we're going to continue, I have to respond to that. Well, it's a yes or no answer. It's a yes or no answer. No such thing as a yes or no answer. Well, to her, is it, I mean, it's, right. she asked a straightforward question. So one response <laughs> and then we move. Yeah, that's What's that? One response and then we move. Yeah. If that's the chairs. Right, so, so one thing I'd like to say, Debbie, to contextualize my answer to your question is that, is that I hear behind it some abiding fear about IMP. And I think that's a function of the fact that for a very extended period of time, people have been able to take shots publicly at it with no basis. So I, so I just, I want to assert that, right? So IMP is this, in, in, in the world of mathematics, is this thing that stands up very, very well. And yet, in the conversation locally, one would never know that. So, to wit, about the future of math at the high school, it's never, you have never heard it out of my mouth. I've never written anything about my judgment where we ought to be mathematically in five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any more discussion on, the, on last year's plan and the update on that? So if not, why don't we move on to the next part of the agenda, which is superintendent evaluation. We don't need this, right? But um, you got things in your package, and um, and then uh, also something in there. We'll just come around. Okay. 
I'm not going to participate so in that. Thousands of trees. Oh, I did. Right. I did this. So there's, there's a uh, state. This is what we already have, right? You already have that. Yes. You already have everything, but I just did, one just of them not by copies email. in case you didn't oh, have it with you. you. Yeah. This was emailed. We, we didn't get a hard copy of this. We got an email. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Of, 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 this, this of this one. We did get a hard copy. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of me. Oh, this is no, stopping sorry. me from getting more paper. So uh, there, there are state standards on how evaluations are done, and that's part of what was in your package and was handed out again. So the, the evaluation, first of all, Kathy, Irv, and I worked over the summer with Maria to come up with this, and the outcome of that is a form, which is this form, which we suggest we use to evaluate the superintendent, and um, it's based on the, stand, the state standards so that you can see that standard one, standard two, standard three, and standard four are addressed in this form. And each standard has a, an indicator um, that we came up with to help determine how the superintendent is doing in each of these standard areas. Um, so this, it's pretty simple. This is the form we suggest we use. Um, per uh, the superintendent's contract, she is to be evaluated on or before February 1st. So probably my suggestion time-wise would be that we would start to bring this up in December, maybe you know, start talking about this then, collect the forms in January, early January, um, have one of the January meetings, perhaps January 24th meeting, be the actual meeting where we do the evaluation. Uh, these forms would be filled out by each of us um, the suggestion is that they could be combined into one summary form, which would then be the public document that gets distributed at the meeting and discussed. Um, it's also important that these indicators are, you know, have check boxes for exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, unsatisfactory, but there's also a comment section, and that's where I think it's really important that you would reference things like. Um, the way I look at it is that you look at how we're doing on the district improvement plan and where you think things are going well or not well, you would note those in the comments and they would inform which box you check off in the actual form itself. Uh, Kathy? I just want to add something to, to what you were saying. I think that as we were developing this, we were noting that really strong connection to the district improvement plan and the idea being that, you know, between comment reports on the district improvement plan and just superintendent updates that we get on a regular basis, it seemed like it would be really conducive to making notes throughout. Like Rick is talking about, we're just going to start talking about it in December, but I think this is really a live document. And if it's going to be really effective, that we would be looking at it on a regular basis and being able to, to make notes when things are being reported rather than you know, in December saying, oh my gosh, let me look back at the last three months and see what's happened and what have we done. Does anything fit anywhere? But I think that there's such a direct correlation between the goals and the district improvement plan and the way that Maria is going to be reporting to us. I think we're really going to be able to do some keeping track of progress all along rather than just waiting till the end. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Did I describe things yeah, well? Yeah. I would just love to add um, two pieces. One is that I would intend to provide the committee with a self-assessment um, similar to the progress that I've, I gave to you today, kind of mid-cycle, mid but also just kind of reflecting on my own work and leadership um, before you have to start, you know, compiling. So I would be happy to do that. And also, if you look at the district improvement plan, I've included corresponding state standards next to each of the goals, which I thought would make it easier so that when we're thinking about what data, what evidence I'd be compiling for each of these goals and where that would make sense connected to the evaluation. I thought it would make it just cleaner for people. Um, and then I think we were going to ask about, at some point, how the committee felt about um, gathering feedback from the community, from partners, from staff, that sort of a, which I know is often a standard. In the last, uh, I guess the last go around of evaluation, um, this, well, the form that was used then was also filled out by a key staff, I think, and that was um, that was submitted too. We we actually didn't talk about doing that at 
at our mm -hmm. meetings with Maria, but we could if we, the committee thought we should do that. Debbie. I, I do think it's a good idea to do that, but I don't think that the same form the school committee was given was handed out to the public. I, it, it wasn't done quite that way. So we should. Debbie would know. Yeah, we, sh know. We, we should just look at the process that was used. But, but I do think that's a really valuable piece. That's valuable information to gather. Kristen. I would just say that um, I guess it was last year the evaluation um, processes changed um, in Massachusetts where things became public documents like if we right. were uh, we can't gather confidential uh, data or uh, excuse me anonymous data and things like that so we'd have to be really clear mm -hmm. about how we're doing it that it's public that people people's comments would be public and signed um, so I think it, it and also I'm not clear in terms of Union 28 um, that that we couldn't write on <laughs> certain documents and it was very very different so I think checking with our lawyer or having mm. some piece of that would be sure. really important about this right now I mean I think that makes sense from both of our perspectives I could check with the MASS lawyer and the school committee should check with I'm um, the school committee mm -hmm. attorney just so that we have a, a clear sense of where we're going just so that we're all comfortable and and know how we're proceeding I think it makes sense my, my personal opinion is that it should be only us who fills out this form because it's us who are in charge of evaluating the superintendent. Getting input, getting other input about how things are do going comes from a lot of different places. Uh, you know, it could be on surveys about how math is doing, but uh, plenty of places we get information, we should get information on how things are going. I don't, I don't know about having a specific survey that's how's the superintendent doing, you know, filled out by the public is, is necessarily a good idea. Yep. I'm, I'm just curious why not. I mean, I, it seems like that's pretty common practice. Didn't they do that with the town manager in, yes. in Amherst? Oh, did they? Yes. yes. We can explore that and okay. see. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it would be important information for us to have in making an evaluation. Um, and maybe we can think of a way to do it so that it's not, you know, people aren't filling out specific surveys, but sending feedback perhaps in some way to the school committee. I'm not sure, but okay. we can think about it. So I, I why don't we look at that? And it's a great idea to look at how the town manager's process worked and not reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Just one other quick question. Um, so last time we did this, we talked about how you would, we, those of us who were both on Region and Amherst or Region and Pelham would fill it out twice, once for Region, once for Pelham. But it, it seems like this really, we don't need to do that, that it's sort of one person, one evaluation form. Is that accurate? That's the way I'm looking at okay. it. Okay, yeah. good. Happy? I'm not so sure that it's simple as that. I think we may have to have a conversation because there's a union and there's a region in terms of an evaluation. <coughs> and so we have to just make a decision about how that's going to work. Have these proposed regulations um, been adopted? Because I, I look at their schedule. I believe so. Yeah, I will like check they, to be they sure. They would have been yeah. adopted. Yeah, I believe so, Irv, because it's it's consistent with the teacher's evaluation process, which right. has been adopted. But I'll check it all for you as well. Right, because when you look at these things, there's there are things in here that I didn't realize. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the school committee, mm -hmm. uh, we look at the um, 35.04 standards and indicators of effective administrative leadership. Mm -hmm. School committee shall establish evaluation systems and performance standards for the evaluation of all administrators that include all of the standards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As we, I'm sorry if I can. Yeah. As, as we look at the new evaluation systems, I think there's gonna be a lot of questions that come up because we will have to look at the administrators, um, the process for evaluating administrators as well. Um, I, could I suggest that it makes sense for the three chairs when we get together again that we revisit these points just so that we can make sure we don't, I just want to be conscious that time will be f fleeting, you know, before we know it will be here. Yep. 
Yeah, sorry to say. Thanks. Okay, let's move on to accepting gifts. Um, would someone like to make a motion to accept these gifts? I would like to make a motion to accept a gift from Stop and Shop A Plus School Rewards to support the heist the principal's discretion. Uh, $6,335.77. Do I have to, I do have to read all of these, right? Yeah. You do? Okay. I, I'd <laughs> like to make a motion to accept the list of gifts totaling $10,823.02. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? All right, that passes. Calendar, um, you have the school calendar. The next regional meeting's on September 13th, and we have one scheduled pretty much two a month. <laughs> if we, so we have plenty of meetings scheduled. Uh, is there, are there items you'd like to see on the future, agen future agendas, Kip? Yeah. Um, Rick, I just have a question for some guidance. Um, the policy subcommittee has been met for mm. several uh, months now, and I just want to make sure that the members are going to, well, even the chair is going to be the same. Are the members going to be the same? Can we proceed, pick up where we left off? That yeah, that's a good point. So we should, if we could tonight, figure out the policy subcommittee and budget subcommittees. Uh, Kip, are you willing to continue to be chair? Yes, I am. Okay, that's great. Uh, Kristen, you're currently on the committee. Are you willing to keep serving there? Is anyone else? And that's it, I think. Kathy, you on it? Yeah, you're on it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Good try, Kathy. <laughs> so, let me just sit back. <laughs> uh, are you willing to continue? Um, sure. Okay, is anybody else interested in being on the policy subcommittee? You. Yeah, I'll try to come as much as I can, but I won't, I won't say I'm actually on the committee. But. Um, now the budget subcommittee. Any anybody interested in chairing that? Mm -hmm. Who was on the budget uh, Me, you, and Debbie. Uh, is that it? Yeah. Uh, I'm Debbie. No, oh, okay. I'm looking at her over there. The chair. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we don't actually vote on that. Are you interested in doing that? It depends on how much support I get. Meaning, I'm not doing minutes. Okay. Who else is on the committee? Is that it? <laughs> as long as Unless Rick does other minutes, people I'm there, I'm in. Okay, I'll, I'll do minutes. Good. Okay. All right, so us three will continue to be on that, and Debbie will be chair. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Oh, items for future agenda. One thing we have to do is the early start date, or what do, or start time. The later start. I, later I'm start trying time. to think. Um, <laughs> I can't. I don't have a copy of the report schedule with me. I think we have school improvement plans during the next meeting, so it would have to be the one later in September. So what we should probably do is meet meet on that issue on September 27th, mm -hmm. and then sometime have a public forum about it, and then meet again to decide whether to do anything or not on that issue. Probably on perhaps the October 25th meeting. Does that sound good? So we're, st we're still in conversation, the administrators, so at this point I have not formalized a recommendation to the committee, so it, I think it's helpful for me to have it be at the end of September. Um, we've been in the conversation okay. a couple of times, so we need one more meeting. Debbie. Wait, I, I'm sorry, did I miss something? Oct the October meeting? Did you just say? I said that I thought we could meet on, the, it's the September 27th meeting, we would meet to discuss that and talk about the report and Maria would have her recommendations. Then we would have a public forum about it. Wait, that, so are we meeting twice a month? Yeah. Starting, okay, that's what I missed. Yep. So there are, they just slipped it in so. with a memo. Yeah. It was never actually a discussion. Right. Well, we have two scheduled per month except for this month. Uh, but we can always drop a meeting if we have to, but that's what we have scheduled. Just remind me when Amherst is in September then, Amherst Committee? Amherst is uh, the 20th. Okay. So between the 13th and the 27th, which is region. So 13, 20, 27 are all meetings. That for, schedule was sent out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All school committee mm -hmm. meetings. It's, it's just a lot easier for us to drop meetings than it is to try to yeah. reschedule after the fact. So I know that that's tough for some people's schedules. I just think we should always consider dropping meetings mm -hmm. because it becomes very easy to 
see a meeting and plan stuff. We have stuff a meeting on the 13th. <laughs> I have no problem if we need it, but. Well, we should we could become very efficient with our meetings. Mm -hmm. So, Debbie, would it be possible for you just to resend out the school year and, uh, school committee calendar? To it's probably posted. It but, is on, it's it's on just the on the website. Well, but if it's I, easier I just, to get yeah. it, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Any, any other comments on future agenda items? I would like to um, uh, possibly hear more about the findings of the inquiry equity group when you. Yeah. yeah. That, absolutely. It will take us a little bit to um, work through that conversation, so it probably would be, you know, October. Okay. But yeah, absolutely. That's Marta's. Sorry, the inquiry yeah. equity group? Um, group that's around equity. Uh, Kip, um, there are uh, a number of policies, yeah. one for first reading and yes. uh, quite a list for second reading and a vote. That, that should really be on the 13th agenda as well, I think. Okay. I think everyone should have copies electronically at least. It's quite a few. Okay, great. Um, okay, so if there's nothing else, uh, we're going to adjourn into executive session for the purpose of discussing contract negotiations. Um, to do so, we, and we will not be coming back to um, public session after that. Um, so to do so, we have to do a voice vote. You state your name and say aye. Am I part of that? Would we have to do Reg and then Amherst and Pelham? Or just in one we shot? Could just in one shot, I think. Yeah. Would you say my name? Amory Foley, Pelham School Committee? Aye. Say aye. aye. Yep. Aye. Spence, aye. Oppie, aye. Weilerstein, aye. Launch, aye. Lucian, aye. Rhodes, aye. Hood, aye. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Do we, did we you just adjourn all three meetings? No, we need to find a space. No, we'll, we'll actually adjourn the meetings. In executive in session. Yeah.